if we had time, Judy, I think I could have used about 10 more minutes of that. That was some of the most, and Judy's so great at figuring these things out, but that was some of the most wonderful, reflective, settling, you know, preparing uh, music. Thank you, as always. Um, I want to welcome Cindy Carr, who is right here. Um, Cindy, as noted in the bulletin, continues to have a long haul of various medical issues, uh, but has experienced some, some better days. And uh, while our prayers continue and while the needs continue for that, it's just awesome to have her here for the first time since all of those serious medical problems had set in. So welcome, Cindy. It's awesome. Awesome to see you. Uh, if you're able to do so, please stand for the Order for Confession and Forgiveness, printed, of course, in your bulletin this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead, showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing and life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds, forgive us our sins, and free us to love for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. It is uh, the Apostle Paul who assures us when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sins to the cross. Jesus says to us, your sins are forgiven. And so be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for us. Amen.
From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And you all may be seated for our first reading of the morning. Good morning. Just real quick before uh, starting with the first reading, just wanted to make a, a really quick announcement. Um, for those that can, uh, do you remember the year 1988? Pretty good year, you know. A lot of important stuff happened that year. We saw, of course, you know, George Bush Sr. being elected president of the United States, Los Angeles Dodgers winning the World Series against the Oakland Athletics, and of course the Olympics taking place in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, but I think more importantly than anything else, especially in the lives of all of us here, uh, one man was ordained to uh, dedicate himself to preach the ministry and be a helping hand for anybody that needed it. Um, and for the past 35 years, I think it's completely undeniable that the job that he has done, A+, plus, uh, inspirational, and just a real pillar of this community. So I think before we get any further, I think we should have a round of applause for Pastor Tom back here. <laughs> No one spoiled the secret record, though. No. <laughs> we, Good we job. We were just at a reunion yesterday, okay. and it came up, how long have you been a pastor? And I said, 35 years. And, you know, we're just, so, no, that's two days in a row now. That's on my mind. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Well, since the secret hasn't been spoiled yet, um, I'm sure, as everybody here knows, we've done the word to mouth last week. After service today, we're going to enjoy some cake and ice cream. I uh, especially want to thank Roy and Rachel over here for helping us put that together as well. And I know Jim Watson was using the secret tunnels of St. John's to spread the word. So it's good to see everybody here. And I even think, uh, where's Barry Williard? I think he's going to do some sort of uh, synchronized dance number with sparklers. So we're all <laughs> going to look forward to that. So look forward to seeing that. So, but very good. So, now the first reading is taken from the 20th chapter of Jeremiah, beginning with the 7th verse. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. Then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary and holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. Psalm 69. Surely for your sake I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that which turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also, and became by word among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me, and the drunkards make songs about me. 
But as for me, this is my prayer to you. At the time you have said, O Lord, in your great mercy, O God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the lion, do not let me sink. Let me be rescued from darkness to hasten, and out of the deep water. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind, and your great compassion turns me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me. Because of my enemies, deliver me. The second reading is taken from the sixth chapter of Romans. Now, should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Now we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You guys. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that's very sweet. And I, I was saying to Josh off mic, and perhaps no one heard, but especially the people on Zoom, that uh, this is two days in a row that that 35 years has been on my mind because yesterday we were at the annual reunion of Ann's father's family and uh, we had missed last year because of Dan's and Rochelle's wedding celebration in Canada. And so after a couple of years passing, one of the, I think, cousin spouses it was, uh, said, yeah, so, you know, how many years have you been a pastor now? You know, when, and I, did 30 yeah 35 years and that rang a bell that at synod assembly they list uh in the annual bulletin of reports various 5 10 15 and sure enough there i was in 35 years uh but anyway i was thinking about wow 35 years and it would in fact be tomorrow uh, i was ordained june 26 which was a sunday that year of 1988 so it is 35 years tomorrow as we speak and uh, certainly has been an honor and a blessing to spend 23 of those uh, in your midst here. Uh, that 23rd anniversary is coming up in just a few more days uh, on July 1st. It was July 1st of the year 2000 that we started our uh, work together here. So um, it, what a wonderful blessing. Uh, would you please stand if you're, if you're able. We're reading this morning from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew uh, in the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the light, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid, you are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. 
Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. When I was working on this uh, sermon, the uh, day before yesterday, finishing some things, um, I was pretty sure that it was Mark Twain who famously uttered the line for the first time that the only two things that are certain in this earthly life are death and taxes. So I, I still think it was Mark Twain, but as the morning was going along, I, I was kind of beginning to doubt myself, and I was thinking it could be the famous humorist Will Rogers, you know, because, of course, that's just the kind of thing he would have come out with as well. So I still think it's Mark Twain, and I would invite anybody who, who might want to Google that to check that out and uh, give us a shout, let me know if we're correct. I think, I think it was Mark Twain. But be that as it may, um, I think uh, it would be a very safe thing to add one item for sure to that list. Death, taxes, and fear. Um, I firmly believe that fear, likewise, is a given in one form or another of a life in this world. And of course, you know, we all know there are fears of all different kinds of sorts. Uh, there are the mildly irrational fears that we call phobias, uh, that in their, in their milder form at least, uh, tend to be make us the butt of jokes, you know, like, oh, what, you're afraid of that spider, or, oh, come on, you know, or that snake, or being up, you know, on that third floor looking out, or, or those kinds of things. Fears that, by and large, don't really get in the way, and pretty much probably only set us up for, for teasing. And uh, water is one of mine. Now, I mean, I, I, I like my shower, and I, I like being on water in a nice, sturdy boat, um, but I don't want to be in water above my head. Uh, I, I have never been any kind of swimmer, and I don't know what it would take to remedy that, but let's just say that has not as yet happened in this life. Uh, so, you know, we have those things, and, and generally speaking, it's just one of those things you get along with. Now, of course, any of those, on the other hand, can rise to a more serious level to the point where they become something that get really in the way of everyday life. And so a given fear, a phobia, can rise to the point of creating anxiety so that people are, are afraid to be around a crowd of people or uh, to go outside their door or you know any number of endless possibilities. It can become something that really, really holds you in bondage. You know, it's in effect tying at least one hand behind your back in trying to relate to, to God's world. Um, there are, of course, also helpful fears. And it's not that, that fear is universally a bad thing. No, 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 no. Um, there is the very justified fear that makes us, you know, kind of be on edge and watchful. For instance, maybe late at night, coming back later than we expected to that parking garage, you know, and there's nobody around, but you know, we're just out of our element, and so we, we hurry that extra bit to get in the car and lock the door, and that's not a bad thing. That is a, a really good example of fear as something um, helpful, maybe even life-saving. And some fears, of course, are, are very personal. Um, you know, probably many or most of us have something here this morning that we are having a particular dread about maybe in the day or days or week or weeks ahead that would not be shared by anybody else here. 
Um, and there, of course, are those universal or global ones. Um, the fear of what seems many times spiraling violence in our world, right? So many hotspots where conflict is openly happening and that seem each day to maybe indicate they could somehow come back to impact us very directly. Or maybe the fear of, of global climate change. You know, when we were bathed in smoke a few weeks ago, um, there was a fair bit of talk about, is that going to be our, our new normal in the summertime? And uh, I, I found myself viscerally with that sense of, of dread and fear if, if, um, of what could be. So fear of all kinds. But I think another truism about fear is, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that fears have a way of sorting themselves out into a kind of pecking order or a, a kind of hierarchy. And, and to that end, I would simply lift up for you days such as you have all had, I know, as I, where you get up in the morning and there's something that's happening that day and you're just so dreading it, you're, you're fearing, how am I going to do there? What's that going to involve? What will that feel like? Whatever the particular fear is. Only to have something else come up that day such that by the end of the day, you find yourself saying, oh, dear God, if only I could go back to this morning, you know? That seems scary enough. If only I could go back and just deal with that. I, that wouldn't be such a big deal anymore. I, I would like to no longer have this new thing to deal with. So fear uh, comes to mind today because Jesus talks about it uh, a great deal in this particular reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Fear is, is one of his major topics, and it makes sense because for Jesus' first disciples, the people closest to him, fear was a real and present thing. And the reading as it goes on, when there's that talk about, you know, children against parents and mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law and families at, at odds uh, with each other, um, that was real life. Uh, that, that was what people then were living as people who from Jewish families found themselves affiliated with this whole Jesus thing that was a new, seemingly new thing come along. And uh, it led to severing of relationships, breaking of relationships. Um, when Jesus talks about not fearing being you know, brought up on trial, that, that too was, was real life for those folks. There was a great deal to fear uh, as Jesus is speaking there. And um, it's so interesting, I think, what he has to say. And because we might expect him, like I, I think I would kind of expect, if I didn't know the text before, that Jesus might come along and say, have no fear. You know, the goal or the answer is don't fear, don't be afraid. Um, like the, um, the tagline that is so unfortunately grammatically incorrect, uh, but uh, live fearless right? You've seen that should be the adverb form, fearlessly. Don't get me started, but live fearless. Um, yeah, right. Blue cross, blue shield. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, Jesus, you see, knows better. <laughs> uh, he knows that it's not about a tagline and it's not about boop, and let there be no more fear. What he says, you notice, is Time to get your fears in order. Time to get your fears in perspective. And he says, instead of even fearing death, even, even finally loss of life itself, he says, nope, there is only one who is really worthy of fear, and that is God alone. And Jesus says, you know, don't fear people that have all kinds of power to throw around in this world, even to the point of taking life. Rather, he says, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, 
And then he quickly adds, the one without whose will not even a sparrow falls to the ground. So if we go back to that idea that, that fears have a way of lining themselves in a, in a kind of pecking order, what Jesus seems to say is for us as his people, it's never going to be about living fearlessly. It, it's never going to be about conquering all fear, nor should it be. But instead, if we hold a healthy, creative fear of God alone, well, then all of the other unhealthy, destructive fears will have a way of falling into perspective. And so they will begin to lose their power over us. And, it, and it's important to add at this point um, that Jesus, of course, and this is not news to you, I think, is not speaking of fear as we would tend to think of a frightening situation, a, a dark parking garage. You know, it, Jesus isn't talking about fear such as we feel, you know, going to some, uh, some horror movie. Um, no, what he's speaking of is one of those other definitions of fear in your dictionary and mine, which usually uses words like reverent awe. So in other words, the fear not of, of terror, not of what harm this can do to me, but rather just gulp of being aware of being in the presence of one as awesome and all-powerful as God. Uh, the one, of course, of Exodus, drowning the Egyptians, parting the sea through the staff of Moses, uh, the one on Sinai in smoke and thunder, before whose presence it seems no one can, can hope to stand. But at the exact same time, this God who brings in new followers, new people into God's family through the water of baptism, you know, something so seemingly devoid of drama and power. Jesus um, challenges us to remember that, you know, we're talking about the God who has made all of this. Uh, you know, if, if you think about the quarry up there, up there on the ridge and how for years and years and years and years they've been taking thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of rock out of that hillside with loads more to come and how that is only one little teeny area of this immediate area, which is only one teeny area of this entire world, which is the merest speck of all of the stuff of creation. And when you think about the one who oversaw all of this coming from something so infinitesimally small that you would not even be able to see it in what we often refer to as the Big Bang as kind of a, a shorthand way of speaking of it, that, that's some scary stuff. That is stuff worthy of, ugh, um, that's the kind of thing of which Jesus is speaking, but the same God who knows even when that sparrow at the feeder bites the dust. That is the God that we're talking about. And so Jesus says, if you keep that as your focus, God in reverent awe, fear God alone, no other thing, no other person can be all that all that make all that much of an impression on us can can hold us back all those other fears not simply or easily but they begin to melt away and so fearing god god alone we can live boldly and confidently in a time when that often seems at least for me pretty hard to do you know as i look ahead in so many different ways and think what does the next year or a couple of years hold for my beloved nation, the United States of America, let alone God's good world? Um, Jesus says you can carry on and rise above it. We can stand our ground fearlessly for truth when it seems to me that so many around us, even people of faith, are taking the low road of convenience, you know, saying what people want to hear rather than what is true in God's mind. 
we can just say, no matter what the consequences, here I stand with Martin Luther. We, we can speak up for justice and mercy and healing when all around us so many voices are, it seems, trying to, if anything, stoke the fear, right? And, and use those people deserving of our mercy and compassion as wedge people to make us afraid and drive us crazy and make us lose our minds so we'll, we'll get all angry and do some really unfortunate things. Fear only God, Jesus says. Only then do we have hope of truly living as God intends it. And you remember the other week how I said I, I wasn't closing with a poem, you know, just the three points? I have a poem for you. No, it, but it's, it's a very applicable verse of a very beloved hymn that really sums this up, I think. And it's Martin Luther, and he's writing as only Martin Luther could do in our beloved hymn, A Mighty Fortress. And you remember this verse. He says, though in, in typical dramatic Luther fashion, though hordes of devils fill the land, all threatening to devour us, we tremble not, unmoved we stand, they cannot overpower us. Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse? I mean, think about that for a moment. That right there is a list of terrors that we face in this life, potentially. Though life be wrenched away, he says, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. But, you know, as I, as I put that together, I thought, really, in closing, even better, and maybe closer to hand, even closer to home, I, I think we can also take as our mantra, um, an important reminder that we get off times from Miss Laurie and from the young person, our younger sisters and brothers, who uh, start off every Sunday, if you've been in there, you've heard them and they really get into this, by singing, our God is a great big God. So forward we go, working at conquering our fears because we remember and carry with us the idea that our God is indeed and only, the only one, a great big God. Amen. And then I don't have to tell you, but please rise if you can. Uh, we join in our proclamation of faith, which also has something to say about fear. Uh, it is the new creed. Let's join together, please. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And so now, trusting in God's abundant mercy, we offer our prayers for a world in need. You entice your church, O oh God, to speak truth that challenges false notions of peace. Prevail upon us with the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, that we are compelled to share the gospel with all the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Under your watch, dear God, not even a sparrow goes unnoticed. Safeguard plant and animal habitats threatened by melting glaciers, rising oceans, and receding coastlines. Amplify the voices of those calling for responsible stewardship of the Earth's resources. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our world is enduring violence and destruction. Rescue your people in the many places and nations experiencing conflict or crisis. Thwart the efforts of those near and far who seek to sow chaos and terror. 
guide those working to bring about peace and justice and reconciliation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you have counted even the hairs of our heads. Reassure anyone experiencing poverty, homelessness, unemployment, or exploitation that every life has value. Look favorably upon those who struggle. We lift up this morning particularly Cindy, Judy, Timothy, Cora, Joyce, Stephen, Jean, Fred, and these loved ones that we are now bold to name before you, O oh God. Answer us, for your steadfast love is good. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Even when we experience rejection, your love invites us to new life. Lift up anyone who feels shunned or excluded on account of their gender, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, or any other human distinction. Make your people one. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All who have died with Christ, also live with Christ. We give thanks this day as we commemorate Philip Melanchthon and all the saints whose faithful confession inspired our own discipleship. And raise us, we pray, with them to eternal life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, this is the place where I often try to remind uh, you about the need for a few helpers to put things away, but um, there may be a greater plan than that one. Um, Josh or anyone, should we let things up for right now? Uh, to okay, so um, instead of putting things down right now, yeah, we'll just let them where they are, and uh, there will be people who tell us what next. I believe. So with that, may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Go in peace, proclaim the good news. We will. Thanks be to God.